Well, thank you all for coming. Uh, I have to say, I feel I'm here under false pretenses a little bit um, because my work is broadly not as, um, about applied science or applications. Some of my work is quite applied. It's to do with mitochondria. And I've already talked to a couple of people who are expecting me to talk about mitochondrial function and diabetes and health issues, and I'm not going to talk about that, so I'm sorry. I'm going to talk about the origin of life. Um, and I, I have a reason to talk about the origin of life. Um, it's about as far from most people's idea of applied science or applications of science as you could possibly get. Uh, and I think that's important because it's, it's one thing that I think a lot of scientists have some difficulty in justifying their existence these days, and I feel that quite strongly, um, that somehow we have to get across to the general public that, um, that science matters, that it's important, that what we know about the world, uh, you know, even if it's purely curiosity-driven, in the long run will have economic benefits that we can't begin to imagine now. And there was this famous quote, of course, from Faraday on the discovery of electricity, uh, where, where, where he was asked, what use could it possibly be? And he said, well, I have no idea, but I'm sure if it has a use, you'll find a way to tax it. Um, <laughs> so this is more or less how I feel about subjects like the origin of life. What I'd like to try and get across to you is that it does matter where this science goes. So even if these are... Um, purely curiosity-driven questions, which it, it is the case, really, in my, in, in my own um, interest in this, there are places where you can see it might really matter. Uh, and that will actually relate to the previous short talk that we've just had. But uh, most of what I'll talk about will be more broad, and I'll try and give you a relatively entertaining overview of the situation that we're at at the moment for the origin of life itself. First problem we have is we cannot define life. It's really a bad start because, you know, there are hundreds of definitions of life and none of them work. Um, there was a famous book by, by Erwin Schrodinger, which is 75 years old this year, or at least his lectures in Dublin were 75 years ago this year, uh, called What is Life? And he didn't answer the question either, but he had a go at it and, and he said there's two, two really critical aspects. One of them, genes, uh, that was not really the term that was used so much in those days, but he was the first person to introduce the term code script into biology. This was 1943, uh, during the war, um, when cryptology was, was, uh, was, was really important. Um, and, and he used this term in biology that the, the chromosomes contain in some kind of code script the entire pattern of the individual's future development uh, and its functioning in mature state. That's quite modern language to biologists today. But he also talked about entropy, uh, and he said life feeds on negative entropy, the device by which an organism maintains itself stationary at a fairly high level of orderliness really consists in continually sucking orderliness from its environment. Now, I have no idea what he meant by that. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure anybody really knows what he means by that. You know, obviously, we are organized, our state is organized, but what exactly are we sucking from the environment? When he wrote that, we didn't know that, that the hereditary code is in DNA, that the double helix um, is how information is stored in biology, and we had no idea how energy and entropy works in biology either. So he was really perspicacious, but his language was much more old-fashioned when talking about uh, energy. It's still a problem. This is, uh, a, a, NASA have a working definition for life, uh, and it, it's, it's, a, it's a self-sustained chemical system capable of undergoing Darwinian evolution. And lots of people have poked holes in that. I think my favorite one is, is the person who said, um, by that definition, a rabbit is not alive, only two rabbits, a pair of rabbits are alive. <laughs> I mean, my own personal bugbear with that is, is this idea of what's a self-sustained chemical system. Sounds disturbingly close to a kind of perpetual motion machine or something. There is nothing which is self-sustained. Here's another example. Um, two fundamental requirements for life as we know. This is not an attempt of a definition of life, but it's, it's, it gives a nice insight into the way that a lot of people approach the problem. Two fundamental requirements, liquid water and organic polymers, such as nucleic acids and proteins. That seems reasonable enough. Uh, water provides the medium for chemical reactions, and the polymers 
carry out the central biological functions of replication and catalysis. Fine, we all know that. That sounds perfectly reasonable. But by that opinion, that dead whale is alive. You know, this is a definition of life that misses out living. Um, and this has been a real problem with the field, is that we, we, we've somehow missed the point over decades. And if we want to understand life, we really need to understand why that's not alive. I bet everybody in this audience has heard of the primordial soup. Yeah? I'm not even going to ask for a show of hands, because I know you've all heard of the primordial soup. This is the best primordial soup that ever existed, and it's dead. So we've got a problem with the origin of life if it started in a primordial soup. How are we going to get beyond that state? Now, Schrodinger actually did have a footnote in What is Life, where he said, if I'd been catering for physicists alone, I should have let the discussion turn on free energy instead. Uh, and he, he probably would have been better if he had. Um, as I say, he didn't know at the time how biological energy conservation actually works. But we turn over, so the universal energy currency, so the way in which we power ourselves is we produce this molecule called ATP. And I think of it a bit like a coin in a slot machine. So you have a coin, you put it in the slot machine, and the slot machine does its thing. This is a protein which, you know, you, you feed it ATP, and it, it does some movement. You give it another ATP, and it does the same thing again. This is basically how enzymes work. But we turn over about our own body weight in ATP every day. It's a tremendous amount. Now, we're making ATP. It goes back to ADP, to ATP. We're, we're just turning it over. We're not synthesizing it from scratch. But we can look at a, another process which gives us a better insight into just how important these processes are. A thing called methanogenesis. Methanogens, I'll, I'll say more about them later on. But basically, they live from reacting hydrogen and carbon dioxide to make methane and water. And they need to make around about 40 times as much methane and water as they do cell. So they're growing from that reaction, and that reaction alone, they don't really need anything. They need some nitrogen, but they can basically get all the carbon and all the energy they need to live from that reaction, but they're producing 40 times as much waste product as they are new cell material. So there's an exergonic reaction, a reaction which is releasing energy, which is powering growth, um, which is going along at 40 times the rate of uh, the, the, uh, of, of production of biomass. And that's true for all of life, really. And if you think back to the origin of life, and you think, well, what could have been happening at the origin of life? Life's a side reaction of this main exothermic reaction. What was that exothermic reaction at the origin of life? We don't really know. It was before we had information, before there was DNA, before there were enzymes and these molecular machines that are driving everything along. So there must have been much more energy to power a doubling of organic matter, to power cell, proto-cell division. Must have been much more carbon and much more energy flow at the origin of life to allow a doubling of anything. So what, what was it? And well, you know, there is no answer. I, I will give you an answer, but you might disagree with me. Here's the answer that I'm sure you all know already. This, uh, this is Stanley Miller. And this was the Miller-Urey experiment. So Urey was his PhD supervisor. This is 1953. And he set up this wonderful experiment. This was the beginnings of experimental work on the origin of life. Um, and he's got some large flasks here. And he's filled them with um, gases, the kind of gases that he thought would have been in the atmosphere of the Earth 4 billion years ago, the same gases that we see today in Jupiter. So methane, ammonia, hydrogen, and so on. And he thought, well, there would be oceans, so there was water, and there would be lightning, there would be electrical storms. So he flashed electrical discharges through these, uh, this, this early atmosphere, and he produced amino acids, the building blocks of proteins. 1953, the same year as the double helix. Um, what a year. Uh, this, this was the bigger news at the time. This was on the front page of Time magazine in 1953. Uh, and it really seemed as if the problem had been solved. All you need to do is zap a mixture of gases, and you get the building blocks of life just congealing out of solution. It really seemed as if this was it. People didn't really know much about information and DNA at the time. They thought amino acids and proteins were the thing. Um, and it's a brilliant experiment. And the media always take pictures of people with their 
apparatus, and here he is some years later, looking, you know, <laughs> older and more and more pissed off with the whole thing. <laughs> He, he kind of died a few years ago quite embittered by the way in which his ideas had been treated. His ideas were... <laughs> this is how they've been treated. Um, he did these wonderful experiments. And, he, he, you know, he, he founded the field, the, the scientific field of the origin of life. So I'm not trying to knock him in any way, but he also came up with a kind of a meme, and this meme is the primordial soup. Um, and as I say, everybody's familiar with this idea, and you know, there's no evidence that it ever existed. None. Um, not, no evidence it existed. It also, you know, it bothered Miller himself that if you try and calculate the rate at which you're going to form amino acids depending on the number of lightning strikes and the, the scale of the oceans, you get a really, really, really dilute soup. So then he spent the rest of his life trying to work out, well, how could I concentrate this soup? Maybe if you freeze it, you can increase the concentration between the ice crystals. Maybe it's not the oceans. Perhaps we're in a, a pond on land or something, and it can concentrate there. There's all kinds of ways that you could do it. But really, it's trying to rescue, in my view at least, it's trying to rescue an idea which is basically unworkable. There's another problem, an entropy problem. Entropy is about the level of organization, if you like, and a soup is about as disorganized as you can get. You know, you, you're a biochemist, you blend things and you lose the structure. Um, and a soup has got no structure, really. It's a problem. How do, you, how do we expect all this structure of living cells to just emerge from a soup? Um, and there's no, there's no thermodynamic driving force there really either. There is, there's lightning, there's UV radiation, whatever it might be. But that tends to have, it tends to break things down as well as make them. And so what you end up with in the soup is a mixture of things which are being formed and being broken down and the waste products and the, the substrates all mixed up in the same place. That's not how we work. We get rid of our excretion products um, and, and all cells get rid of their excretion products, and so that's how they manage to not be a soup, you might say. So there are some serious problems, and I, I love this quote. Uh, he said something pretty nasty about me once as well, which I was quite <laughs> proud about. Gunter Wechstershäuser uh, was, is one of the pioneers. Um, he kind of appeared on the scene in the late 80s, early 90s, and, uh, and, and there's really no love lost. I, I like quoting this to my students to give them a feel for the reality that science is not people being nice to each other and being objective about things. You get this, the prebiotic broth theories received devastating criticism for being logically paradoxical, incompatible with thermodynamics, chemically and geochemically implausible, discontinuous with biology and biochemistry, and experimentally refuted. So you can see why uh, Stanley Miller looks <laughs> so pissed off towards the end of his life. It's... It's a problem. Now, the, the, the area, the, the, the kind of environment that Vexershäuser thought that life might have started in were hydrothermal vents down at the bottom of the ocean, volcanic type vents. And I put this slide together a few years ago now, and I, I lost a tin of soup down there, and I've always left it there ever since because it, it kind of gives the sense of just how inconsequential soup is in comparison with these amazing black smoker systems. Now, the problem with soup is that it's basically at equilibrium. Nothing's really going to change in a sustained way. This is most definitely not. You've got two extremely different environments in direct, um, almost conflict in, in, in this way. You've got um, these, <coughs> this smoke is in fact iron sulfides and so on, coming up from it, the water interacting with magma um, down below the surface in a, in a uh, and, and this is it's, it's precipitating out as it hits the oceans. This is a far from equilibrium system. This is happening continuously over years, decades, um, and it supports an astonishing ecosystem. So the, the, the level, these are <coughs> all tube worms. No, these are probably shrimp section. No, I can't see what they're. These are tube worms. OK, these are the tube worms. Um, the, le the density of life down around these black smoke events is about the same as a tropical rainforest. But you're down four or five kilometers down at the bottom of the oceans in inky blackness. You're completely cut off from the sun. Or at least you appear to be completely cut off from the sun. But in reality, you're not. So <clears throat> all, of these, all of these animals down there depend on the bacteria. But they effectively, the tube worms, cultivate these bacteria inside themselves. They don't have a, a mouth or an anus. They don't eat. <laughs> 
They simply live from the bacteria that they cultivate internally. Now, those bacteria grow because they get the hydrogen sulfides that's coming out of the vents, and they react it with the oxygen in the oceans around, and that's basically where they get their energy from. I said oxygen. The oxygen is coming from photosynthesis, and photosynthesis is a, you know, it's life, is producing oxygen by photosynthesis. Go back to the origin of life, there wasn't any photosynthesis, and so this system could not possibly have existed back then. Now, Vexus Heuser, of course, he's a smart guy, he knows this very well, and he came up with a system which must have seemed like magic, really. He talked about the iron sulfur world, but he talked about iron pyrites, fool's gold, and he talked about sewer gas, hydrogen sulfide gas and carbon monoxide, so a couple of poisonous gases and fool's gold, and this is how life started, according to Gunter Vexus Heuser. He actually had an essay which he entitled Life as We Don't Know It, uh, and it, you know, it's another, it's another question, just how, how much does the origin of life have to resemble life as we know it? And does it matter? I'll argue that it does matter. <laughs> There's been some real progress in the backwards direction um, from <laughs> people in Cambridge. Uh, <laughs> There's some very smart people here, uh, and, and they've done some beautiful chemistry uh, about the origin of information, the origin of the nucleotide building blocks of DNA. Uh, and you start with cyanide. So now forget about these gases from, the, uh, from, from, from Miller's primordial soup. We now think, and you know, we don't really know, but we think that there wasn't so much methane and ammonia and hydrogen in the early atmosphere. Um, and if you repeat these same experiments and you use CO2 and dinitrogen and let's say water, well, you don't really get anything very much. But if you use cyanide or cyanoacetylene and you use UV radiation, you, get, you can get nucleotides that way. This is you know, 60 years worth of battling to try and make the building blocks of DNA under prebiotic conditions. This is you know, 60 years after the Miller-Urey experiment. It was done uh, by John Sutherland and Matt Powner, who's now at UCL, where I am. It's beautiful chemistry, and it bothers me because it doesn't look like biochemistry. I'm a biochemist and I bring my day job into these questions and I look at this and I think, well, is that really how life started? It's kind of Frankenstein chemistry to me. Um, and this is really the, the light motif of the last 60 years of prebiotic chemistry. What are the substrates? These are the building blocks, the starting materials. Cyanide, cyanamide, formamide, um, polyaromatic hydrocarbons, which have been called buckyballs from outer space, but these are kind of giant complex lattices of, uh, of, of um, hydrocarbons. What are the solvents? Not water, but formamide or silicate gels or supercritical water maybe, or wet dry cycles. What are the catalysts? People talk about iron pyrites, as I've said, or borate or zinc sulfide. Um, reaction pathways, cyanosulfidic protometabolism. I don't, I'm not going to test you on remembering these things, but my point is, you know, if you're a biologist or a biochemist, they'll be pretty unfamiliar to you. Uh, this is not how life works, and I probably don't need to say any more than, you know, take some cyanide if you don't believe me, and you'll realize that <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's really not how we work. It doesn't mean that's not how it started, but it, it does raise this serious question about, well, how can we get at the question? Why do we even care in a way? Well, <clears throat> I think we can get at the question. This is uh, Christian de Duve, and this is a lovely quote from one of his books. He, he, uh, he died a few years ago, um, but he, he got his Nobel Prize for cell structures, and he was one of the few biologists who took the origin of life seriously as a subject. Lots of physicists do, and, and um, cosmologists, and astrophysicists. Lots of chemists do. But in biology, for decades, really it was considered rank speculation of the kind that really, you know, retired Nobel laureates were allowed to do, but nobody else should. It would finish your career if you were. So, so, so de Duve was really important. He, okay, he was a retired Nobel laureate, but <laughs> <laughs> he, he really thought in a very serious way about, about these questions. Uh, I mean, the other person who brought the field into a little bit of disrepute was Francis Crick. Um, now, I'm not sure Crick would define himself as a biologist. He was really a, 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 a physicist by, by, by training. But he became interested in this question of the origin of life. And, and, and he ended up writing a book uh, called Life Itself. I don't know if anyone... Did anyone read Life Itself? You should. 
It's very good. Um, <clears throat> it's about what he called directed panspermia, the idea that life was seeded on Earth, not by some comet hitting from, from outer space, but by a rocket, that, uh, and we've been deliberately seeded by, um, by some alien civilization, uh, the great Francis Crick. So <clears throat> he had a reason to argue that, and it was based on the genetic code and the idea of a frozen accident and the, the, the improbability of all life sharing the same genetic code, given that that code appeared to be completely mad and could have, you know, it, it was full of repetitions and strangeness that Crick had imagined there would be a beautiful mathematical solution, and there wasn't. So that was what led him down that line. So I wouldn't say that he was bringing a biologist's intuition to the question. But, but de Duf did, and he said, <clears throat> how did proto-metabolism come to be replaced by metabolism? He said the obvious answer to this is that the appearance of catalysts, whether they're proteins, enzymes, or ribozymes made of RNA, um, or both, uh, was responsible for the transition. Okay, that sounds reasonable. And we have to ask how catalysts with the appropriate properties came to appear. And he said the only scientifically plausible explanation is that catalysts arose through selection. When he says scientifically plausible, I guess what he means is that if we say, okay, let's put God to one side, it's not God. This is an assumption, by the way. Everything we do on the origin of life, we'll never know how life started on Earth. We can just try and grapple with the question. And it's, it's an assumption that we must do, which is to say we assume that it starts on Earth rather than somewhere else in the universe. Because if it's somewhere else in the universe, how can we possibly know? How can we do an experiment or ask a question? We've got no way of narrowing the playing field. Perhaps it was God. But, you know, as soon as we, this is true for all of science, as soon as we evoke supernaturalism and say that there's, a, you know, some miracle occurred, then we can't ask any scientific questions about it either. So this is thinking along those lines. We don't know how life started, but we can wrestle with the question and try and get a feel for it. And the assumptions we have to make is it wasn't God that did it. Um, so we assume that catalysts arose through selection. But if enzymes are selected, they can only be selected if they fit into proto-metabolism. In other words, you've got something happening in geological conditions, some kind of geochemical pathway, and the catalysts improve this pathway and tend to close down that pathway. So this is pure imagination, but it's a way of structuring thinking about the problem. So we're thinking about energy and carbon and what was directing that flux and flow to make things grow and replicate and multiply very early on. Is there, equivalent to DNA, equivalent to information, some kind of universal energy currency which is conserved across all of life? And the answer is yes. And it's not actually this molecule ATP. It's the use of what are called ion gradients across membranes, so generally proton gradients. Protons are the, the positively charged nuclei of hydrogen atoms, and a proton gradient is simply you have more protons on one side of a membrane than on the other. I'll say more about that. But this proton gradients across membranes are as universal as the genetic code itself. Now, I said I'm not going to talk about mitochondria. I'll talk a little bit about mitochondria. These are your mitochondria. Uh, you have, I, I've lost count, uh, you know, about 100 trillion mitochondria, I think, if I can remember correctly. <clears throat> you have hundreds, if not thousands, in all your cells, and this is where respiration is going on. These are the Christie membranes uh, in the mitochondria. So this is where you're burning food in oxygen to provide you with the energy, but not just the energy, also all the, all the building blocks that you need to build cells. So it's happening there. And this is what's going on in a nutshell. In these membranes here, if you think of this band bar across the bottom as this membrane here, what we're doing is we're stripping electrons from food and we're passing them in the end to oxygen. And they're going down inside the membrane and these circles here are supposed to be giant protein complexes inside the membrane. And I'll show you what that one of them looks like in a moment. But effectively, we have a, a flow of electrons, a current of electrons going from food in the simplest sense to oxygen. And that current of electrons is powering the extrusion of protons, these H plus the, the, um, the, the nuclei of hydrogen atoms, across the membrane. So we have this proton gradient, lots of protons on this side, very few on this side. And then we have a kind of a turbine sitting here in the membrane, the ATP synthase. This is making this coin that I mentioned, which is powering the slot machines. It's being powered, its synthesis is being powered, whoops, by this turbine in the membrane. 
Uh, and the whole system is a little bit like a hydroelectric power scheme. So the protons are equivalent to the water, the dam is equivalent to the membrane, and the electrical turbine, which is powering ATP synthesis, well, that's what it looks like. It's an extraordinary nanoscopic protein motor, a rotating motor. It's literally a rotating motor. This structure was discovered by Sir John Walker after you know, decades of research. He's here in Cambridge, just down the road. Um, and it's really one of the most beguiling molecular machines in all of biology. And if you, you know, it's conserved across all of life. There are very, very few cells that don't have this, this device. And those that don't have it obviously lost it relatively recently. We can see all the telltale signs in their genomes. So we don't really know. I'm not going to tell you how this evolved because I have no idea how this evolved. This is plainly a product of genes and natural selection, and that does not just pop out of nothing like Fred Hoyle's building a jumbo jet by a typhoon coming through a junkyard or something. That doesn't happen. This is a product of genes and natural selection, but it's universally retained across all of life, and so it presumably gives some kind of signal that early on in evolution, proton gradients across membranes were important. We can't really say much more than that. This idea goes back to Peter Mitchell, um, back to 1961. And this is Mitchell actually in 1947 in Cambridge with Jennifer Moyle, who was his lifelong um, collaborator. She actually did all the experiments. Mitchell, I'm told, was cack-handed in the lab. Uh, and it was Jennifer Moyle who really did the experiments. Uh, but Mitchell had a, a, an imagination and a, a way of seeing things that, that really revolutionized the whole of biology. Um, <clears throat> going back to 1957, four years before his nature paper on the chemiosmotic hypothesis, there's this lovely quote from a conference in Moscow on the origin of life. So there's no accident it was in Moscow. Um, most of the people who were there were communists. Uh, and, 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 you know, it was J.D. Bernal, a great, great crystallographer, and J.B.S. Haldane. Um, and it was organized in part by Oparin, who was a, a great Soviet uh, biochemist who was interested in the origin of life. They were all interested in materialistic origins of life. They, they were not interested in wishy-washy ideas of God did it. They were interested in how can we account for, 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 for life in materialistic terms. And Mitchell himself, well, he was not a communist at all. Um, he was really more philosophically minded, and he was, he was independently wealthy. Uh, his uncle was the founder of the Wimpy Construction Empire, and apparently Mitchell used to drive a silver Rolls Royce around Cambridge during the war years. Um, but he, <clears throat> this, this quote I like a lot. This was from his talk in Moscow in 1957. And he said, I cannot consider the organism without its environment. Environment. Remember I said that quote earlier on about self-sustained? So Mitchell is already thinking not about life sustaining itself, but about the environment. From a formal point of view, the two may be regarded as equivalent phases. So the, the cell, the bacterial cell, I think he had in mind, and its environment. These are equivalent phases. This is quite radical thinking. Between which dynamic contact is maintained by the membranes that separate and link them. And membranes are... You know, a few nanometers thick. They're very, very thin things. That's to say a few millionths of a millimeter thick. Um, they're very, very flimsy. And he's saying on one side you have the environment, on the other side you have the inside of the cell. Uh, and the, the, the thing which links and connects them is this membrane around the edge. Now, what he realized is that, well, if how, he, was a, he described himself as a physiologist, and he was wondering, well, how does a bacterial cell keep its inside different to the outside? Why is it that this flimsy link between the outside world, these two equivalent phases, how is the inside a living system and the outside is just the environment? Um, and he realized, well, you've got to pump things, actively pump things out. You've got to recognize particular molecules and you've got to get rid of that one and you want to bring this one in and you want to get rid of that one. And so you've got to do a lot of selection. Uh, and, and so these are enzymes in the membrane, but you can't, you know, it costs energy to do that. You, you've got to pump these actively out, recognize things and pump them out. It costs energy. And if you just allow it to run the other way, he realized, well, if you allow, for example, protons to come in, you could conserve, in principle, you could conserve that energy if you've been pumping them out uh, and, 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 and tap off that energy. And, and he realized that he was thinking about how bacteria work. And as a leap, 
realize that that's how respiration in our own mitochondria works. And this is one of the great things about science and one of the reasons why it's important to you know, keep, allow people the freedom to follow their nose wherever it goes because his insights into it really revolutionized the way that biology works. So <clears throat> how on earth can we get any insight into how that kind of complex system might have started? Well, we can do it these days by information, by phylogenetics, by looking at a tree of life and trying to track it all the way back. So we're up here somewhere where you carry it. So I'm not going to talk about this bit. We appear to have come about, to have originated in a, some kind of a genomic chimera between two cells that came together. One got inside the other one. But back down here, this tree was done by Bill Martin, who's a, one of the most brilliant biochemists uh, of, of recent years. And, and this was done in 1998, and it's pretty radical. He has two separate emergences of life down here uh, from Luca, which is the last universal common ancestor, coming out of a hydrothermal vent down at the bottom of the ocean. And we are produced by this, this chimera here. I'm not going to go into much detail on that, except to say that it's pretty weird. And if you try to follow it back and, and work out what's going on, well, we come to something like methanogens. So methanogens, well, we know about methane in cows and so on. It's a, it's a serious problem. It's produced not by the cow, but by these bacteria that live inside the intestines that require pretty strictly anoxic conditions inside the cow's intestine. And, and we've known for decades about methanogens producing methane on a very large scale, but we've not really understood how they do it. It's only in the last 10 years that it's become clear how they work. And this is a very grossly simplified view of it. But effectively, they live from hydrogen and CO2, which I mentioned earlier on. This is this process of methanogenesis that's producing 40 times as much waste product. What's it doing? It's taking the two electrons from hydrogen it's sending one this way to a thing called ferrodoxin and the other one this way to what's uh, it's a heterodisulfide, but it doesn't matter. What matters is that this is an, an endergonic reaction. It's not going to happen spontaneously. But this is exergonic. It should happen spontaneously. And so the two are coupled together so that the exergonic reaction will power the endergonic reaction. And they're coupled so that it effectively splits the energy from the, from the electron pair and uses the excess energy from one electron to power uh, the other electron. And this is something called electron bifurcation. It's really electron pair bifurcation. It reduces ferrodoxin, which reduces CO2. So I'm using this term reduce. Effectively, it just is stuffing hydrogen and electrons onto carbon dioxide to make organic molecules. So in this case, this is a methyl group attached to a cofactor. That methyl group is passed to a different cofactor. It then picks up another couple of electrons from here, and it's released as methane. Don't worry about the, any of the details of that. All, this is a merry-go-round. We've got electrons coming from here. They're coming around the cycle and going off down there. And the whole thing can just go on and on and on. All the electrons from hydrogen are going onto the CO2, and they're being released as methane. And that's it. So why is that any use? Well, it's useful because of this bit. This is what's called the methyl transferase. A methyl group is being passed from here to here. And it releases some energy. And that energy is used to pump a proton across that membrane. That's all it does. So all of this process, all of this 40 times as much um, pumping out methane and water is just used to produce a proton gradient across the membrane. So what, why do they want that? Well, they use it directly here with this ECH, energy converting hydrogenase. It's another membrane protein. It's taking the electrons from hydrogen and passing them onto ferrodoxin as well, which passes them onto CO2 just as before. But this is being powered not by electron bifurcation, but by a proton gradient across that membrane. So the protons come flowing through here, um, and they're, they're powering this. So you know, I've got the ATP synthase down here. The methanogens use the ATP synthase as well. But the ATP synthase, as I said before, is almost impossible to imagine how it emerged in a prebiotic world. It's a product of genes and evolution. But this, this is an iron sulfur protein in a membrane. Can we imagine ways of that? Because this is more fundamental, you might say. What this is doing is driving growth. This is driving the reaction between hydrogen and CO2 to make organic molecules. So the proton gradient across a barrier is driving growth. And now we're talking in terms that make sense for the origin of life. So is there an environment 
you know, is there an environment where you have a natural proton gradient? Well, the answer is yes. It was discovered <coughs> about um, 18 years ago uh, by Deb Kelly, the captain of the Alvin submersible. Um, and this, this is a place called Lost City. So these are not like the black smokers that I showed you earlier on. These were discovered relatively recently, and they're not dramatic in the same way. There's no black smoke belching out of the top of these things. In fact, we probably should call them white non-smokers. Uh, but they're not dead. They, 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 they look a bit dead. But there's plenty of bacteria living in these systems. We don't see the animal life that you see around the black smokers. That's just not there. But with lots of hydrogen gas bubbling out of them, and hydrogen, I've been talking about hydrogen and CO2, so we're, we're, we're looking at a system where, we, <clears throat> where we, it looks the right kind of molecules seem to be there. These vents were actually predicted by a guy called Mike Russell <clears throat> um, 10 years before they were first discovered. Uh, and Mike Russell is a, is, is a bit of an iconoclastic geologist. Um, he's from the east end of London. He kind of grew up as a street urchin in East London and ended up qualifying as a geologist and doing industrial geology most of his life. Uh, and, and he'd been um, scouring for minerals. Uh, and very often, mineral deposits are found in hydrothermal systems, extinct hydrothermal systems. If you want to go looking for gold or whatever it may be, hydrothermal systems are a good place to be looking, I'm told. Um, <clears throat> and he realized that the kind of conditions in these vents, and he predicted they should exist down at the bottom of the oceans as well, could potentially give rise to life. And he spent the last 30 years, since 1988, working on these questions. He's 80 years old next year, and he's still going strong. Most people ignored him completely until the discovery of Lost City, which he predicted more or less exactly where it should be and what it should look like and the kind of conditions there. And so he became famous overnight. And this is uh, Nature actually did this uh, Photoshop version of Mike, um, dressed as Erasmus, as the Renaissance man. And they called him Naissance Man, Naissance as in the birth of life. And they've got a bit of Lost City behind him, and this is the reactor that he built at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory where he is these days. And really what he said is that this is what it looks like, Lost City. You've got this kind of labyrinth. It's like a, a mineralized sponge, and the hydrothermal fluids, they don't belch out of the top of a chimney. They kind of wend their way through this mineralized sponge. And the hydrothermal fluids are warm rather than hot, maybe 70, 80, 90 degrees. They're strongly alkaline, pH 10, 11, thereabouts. Um, they're rich in hydrogen gas. This is a reaction between rock and water going on down beneath the surface. And it's basically, it's caustic soda bubbling with hydrogen gas and nice and warm. Um, today, these are made of carbonate rocks, ar aragonite. But four billion years ago, before there was any oxygen in the atmosphere, we think that there would have been iron in the oceans. We're fairly sure about that, dissolved ferrous iron. And some sulfide coming out of the vents. And so we think there would have been iron sulfur minerals in these walls. This is pure conjecture. We have no idea if there really was, but reasonably there should have been. And so this is essentially what Mike pictured as the equivalence between the cell, which I've shown you already with protons outside and flowing in down a concentration gradient across this membrane, and a pore in a hydrothermal vent with acidic oceans, again, Lots more CO2 four billion years ago. We don't know how much more, but there was certainly a lot more. Probably pH 5 or 6. And inside, maybe pH 10 or 11. And don't think of this as the outside of the vent. Think of this as a pore inside the vent. So there's an equivalence between these two systems. It's acid outside, alkaline inside, and there's a barrier between the two phases. But how on earth can you go from here to here? Is there some way that we can use Christian de Duve's maxim and think of a series of steps that will take us from this to that. Here we have no genes, no information, no organics, no lipids, no proteins, nothing. And we've got to end up here, which is a fully organic system. And it may be that, <clears throat> you know, I'm just deluding myself that it's possible to cross this. But the good thing about it, and the reason why I'm talking about it, because it, it begins to come onto more applied ideas now, is that this is a testable system. So what would we expect to happen? Hydrogen and CO2 should react together, but they don't. We know that they don't. If they did, well, we can strip CO2 out of the atmosphere, probably even more effectively than 20% more forests. 
And, and we don't have to try and bury it down in the bowels of the earth or something. We can just make synthetic gasoline from it straight away or whatever else that we might want for the chemistry industry. So <clears throat> if we could make that reaction work, it really would have applications on a scale that I cannot begin to comprehend. And it should work. This is what the thermodynamics say. Under these warm alkaline conditions, um, this is the free energy again. Naught means there's no change. If it's positive, it means you have to put energy in to get anything out. But down here, where it's negative, total cell biomass should be formed, which is to say, if you have a mixture of hydrogen and CO2 and you mix it all up at, at, at 70, 50 to 75 degrees or so, uh, in alkaline conditions, you should get cells forming. Of course, you don't get cells forming, but, I mean, thermodynamics says you should get cells forming. You should get mostly amino acids, what the Miller-Urey experiment showed under different conditions. You should get fatty acids, these are the components of membranes. Nucleotides, as we already know, are quite hard to make. It took 60 years, and they're way up there. You've got to put energy in. But in theory, if you could capture some of the energy released from making amino acids and put it into here to make nucleotides, the system, this is why total cell biomass is down, is down there. So in terms of thermodynamics, it works. But thermodynamics says what should happen or what should not happen. It doesn't say the kinetics. It doesn't say whether it's going to happen now or not at all. And this is another way of seeing what the problem is. This is um, a redox couple. This is what's called the reduction potential. Uh, so here is the redox potential of hydrogen proton couple. And at pH 7, it's about uh, minus 420 millivolts or thereabouts. We can't see if that's actually, yes, OK. Um, this, is, this is carbon dioxide through to uh, formaldehyde, and it's about minus 580 millivolts which is to say you've got to put energy in to get up there. It's not going to happen spontaneously. So although if you can make them react, in the end you should get energy out. That first step, there's a barrier to their reaction, and that barrier is that hydrogen just is not reducing enough. It, to, get, to make this an organic molecule, you've got to take the electrons from hydrogen and put them onto CO2. And the hydrogen has to push its electrons onto CO2, and it doesn't really want to very much. It's quite happy as it is. And the CO2, it has to grab these electrons, and it doesn't really, it's very stable as well. It doesn't really want them very much either. So they just coexist quite happily together <laughs> for millions of years. Um, they're hardly going to react at all. But that's at pH 7. If we look at the conditions in the vents, hydrogen's at pH 11, and CO2's at pH 6, and the pH changes the reduction potential. At pH 11, hydrogen really wants much more to push its electrons onto something else. It's quite simple chemistry, really. If you, if you push your electrons onto something else, what's left behind are the protons, and the protons in an alkaline solution react immediately with hydroxide ions to make water, thermodynamically as stable as can be. And so that's much more favored in alkaline conditions. And CO2, it has to pick up these electrons. Well, to, to become formaldehyde, it needs to pick up a couple of electrons. That's two negative charges. It doesn't want any more. It doesn't really even want that many. But if there's protons around, it can balance those charges. So in acidic conditions, it can balance the charges. And so it's far more willing to pick up those electrons. So in event, it should work. But the problem is that if you have mixing, you're back here. So if there's any mixing of these solutions, there's a problem. It's not only this hydrogen and the CO2. It's also the iron sulfur minerals that you find in these vents. They can also get protonated on their surface, and that changes their reduction potential, and this is the ferredoxin, which is the iron sulfur protein that I've talked about. The cluster at the heart of this, this ferredoxin is very, very similar in its structure to the iron sulfur minerals you find in the vents. This is, from earlier this year, the structure of the energy-converting hydrogenase, uh, and it's got these iron sulfur clusters right at the heart of it, four of them. Um, this is where the proton channel is, and the uh, protons are coming through in the vicinity of these iron sulfur clusters. And we've known for a few years um, that the two which are quite close um, to, to the channel uh, are pH dependent, which is to say if, there's a, if, 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 if the pH changes, as it would do as protons come through, their, their reduction potential changes. They become more reducing or less reducing. They're more likely to push electrons onto hydrogen or more likely to receive electrons or push them onto something else. So this whole system is a kind of molecular machine for taking electrons 
and pushing them onto something that doesn't want them. It's all pH-based, so it seems. We don't know exactly how it works yet, but that's roughly what's going on. So, applications, how does this work? Can we do some experiments? It's hard to know. Think that we're deep inside this vent. Here's the structure you've already seen. This is the structure of the ECH that I've shown you already. Effectively, we have protons outside, hydrogen and relatively alkaline conditions inside, and a flow of protons across that membrane. The easiest way to think of it when I was initially thinking of it was to think of this barrier as a semiconducting barrier. So we have hydrogen in alkaline conditions, which makes it more reducing, CO2 in acidic conditions, more easily reduced, and a semiconducting barrier between the two with electrons transferred across it. And if I'd given this talk two months ago, that's where I'd have stopped. I've been bothered for a long time that this, this is actually the opposite topology to this. Maybe it's more like this. Maybe the, high, the protons and the CO2 are crossing this barrier. Uh, and the reaction's taking place on this surface here, where it's been, the pH is being locally modulated. This, the topology is the same as the ECH. We've been trying to do some experiments. This is uh, the first reactor that we built. We were making little hydrothermal vents inside the system. It didn't really work terribly well, um, so we tried to build a microfluidic chip instead. Um, this is the chip. This is the precipitate inside the chip. And this is, uh, this is a close-up of the, of, of the precipitate inside the chip. I'll come back to that in a moment. We've had a little bit of success. I'm not very happy with what we've got, but just to show you that we do get something. This is formaldehyde forming on the precipitate. So this is the thing which is supposed to be difficult to make. This is at the top of that kinetic barrier. We can make formaldehyde. These are the controls. We can also make formate and carbon monoxide bound to the ferrous ion. So you know, we're seeing some basic, simple, reduced CO2 products there. But our system was really bad, and what we're trying to do is with this microfluidic chip. This is what I, um, we, we, can, we can maintain pH gradients, quite steep pH gradients, even in the absence of a barrier at all. But this is the barrier, and the, the, the yellowy, greeny color is with a pH indicator showing that it's acid all the way across this barrier. So the protons really are crossing that barrier, and this is the place where we're really looking to see some kind of uh, organic reactions going on. <coughs> What's been missing, I think, from the origin of life is this idea that structure matters in biology, that membranes matter, that what's happening across the membranes are, are, are ion gradients, and the ion gradients modulate reactions. And I don't think, really, that anybody, apart from a handful of people, have tried to set up a system where you've got the structure in the system itself. And the question is, can we reduce CO2? Basically using methanogens as an example of how biology does it. And if it's possible to do it, uh, coming back to the applied idea, simply having acid in one channel, alkali in another channel, hydrogen which can be produced by splitting water from synthetic photosynthesis and so on, to make organic molecules on that surface. I don't know if we're going to get there or not, but it seems to me that if we'd simply believed what the chemists said and started with cyanide, we wouldn't be even thinking about those kind of questions. If we follow the biology through to its logical conclusion, and think, well, what's it saying? What is the topology? How do we understand that topology? Why might it matter? How can you have a pre prebiotic system which is driving this chemistry? Well, I'm interested in the chemistry of the origin of life, but I can see immediately that it could have all kinds of uh, useful applications. What would we expect to get? I'm very close to the end now, because I can see a few of you are beginning to look a little worn. Um, <laughs> We're starting with, with activated CO2, probably bound onto the, 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 the surface here. What have we got? Hydrogen. We make the formyl group bound onto the surface as well. I'm assuming a lot of surface chemistry. And more hydrogen, we get through to this methylene group and, and through to a methyl group. So this is basically the same chemistry that we see in methanogens. Now, methyl group reacts with carbon monoxide to produce not acetyl-CoA, but get rid of that CoA bit. That's a complex molecule. And we have an acetate group attached on here. More CO2, more hydrogen, we get pyruvate. More CO2, we get oxaloacetate. More hydrogen, we can get glyceraldehyde. And more hydrogen and CO2 all the way through to sugars like ribose, which we have made ribose in, in the lab, starting with formaldehyde. Um, <coughs> alpha ketoglutarate, from there we can make glutamate or aspartate from oxaloacetate. These are amino acids which, in life, are always derived from these Krebs cycle intermediates. Uh, these are, so basically, a mixture of hydrogen and CO2 
gives you, and a lot of this, is, everything that is in blue here has been done under prebiotic conditions, not always by us, but by, by someone or other. Um, this is what you get if you start with hydrogen and CO2. You get carboxylic acids. From carboxylic acids, you make amino acids, like glutamate and aspartate and so on, or up here, glycine. From pyruvate, you make sugars. And everything in boxes here, in red boxes, these are the starting materials that life uses to make nucleic acid building blocks. It's not starting from cyanide, it's starting from aspartate and glutamine and formyl groups or uh, um, not acetylphosphate but ATP, but we think acetylphosphate might work. So <clears throat> will it work? I don't know, but what I'd like to leave you with is the final piece of application, if you like. What I've just shown you is this and I'm now putting it in more conventional terms. We're starting with hydrogen and CO2. A couple of steps down the acetyl-CoA pathway gives us acetyl-CoA, hydrogen, CO2 to pyruvate into the Krebs cycle. This is a reductive Krebs cycle, which is to say you're, you're taking in hydrogen, you're taking in CO2, and you're making the carbon backbones, the carbon skeletons that are required for all of the building blocks of life. To make amino acids, you're starting with oxaloacetate or pyruvate. To make sugars, you're going up to phosphoglycerate and so on. To make, <clears throat> to make nucleotides, you're starting again from amino acids, uh, where you're starting from oxaloacetate and so on, as I've just shown you. There's only one step missing here to close this complete Krebs cycle. And this is what, this is what methanogens have. They have what's called an incomplete uh, reduced, reducing Krebs cycle. Starting with hydrogen and CO2 and ending up with these longer carbon skeletons, which are the building blocks for everything else. And this is what life does in anaerobic conditions at the bottom of the oceans, in stagnant muds, in hydrothermal vents, in our own intestines, in methanogens. <clears throat> and when there's oxygen in the atmosphere, this whole cycle spins in reverse. It flips its direction. And instead of taking in hydrogen and taking in CO2, it takes sugars from here, from pyruvate, oxaloacetate, and it pulls out the hydrogen, and it feeds it into our mitochondrial respiratory chain, and it burns the hydrogen. We're burning rocket fuel, that's what we're doing. It's burning the hydrogen, and it's spitting out the CO2. So it's doing this in exactly the opposite direction. As soon as you have oxygen in the atmosphere, this turns its direction <coughs> spontaneously, and there's no way you can stop it from doing that. And it has a huge effect on our own health. And I don't think we've ever really understood why the Krebs cycle is so important to human health. But it's become really clear over the last five to ten years that this can go backwards in us too. That in cancer, for example, um, to, go from alpha, to, to come in for alpha ketoglutarate to isocitrate to citrate and then export the citrate into the cytoplasm, that's common in cancers. What do they use the citrate for? Well, they break it back down into acetyl-CoA and make fatty acids. They need these building blocks to grow, cancer cells. All the building blocks that are required for life come from this cycle. And now, we're using that cycle not only for energy, we're getting all the energy we need to grow from burning these things, but we're also still using all these intermediates to make nucleotides, to make amino acids, to make fatty acids, and so on. So this, this cycle, which started out in almost certainly st strongly reducing anoxic, anaerobic conditions down at the bottom of the ocean is written into the very structure of life and all cells are using something pretty similar to that. Not to get energy out of, they have to put energy in. All these stars are where they're putting the energy in. But to make the organic building blocks for growth. So when you start to think about the origin of life and you, you come up with a structure like this, it's not me that came up with this structure, but this is the structure that you, we see in cells and that makes sense from the point of view of the origin of life. And then you think, what are the consequences of flipping that in terms of now it's trying to do two things at once. It's trying to make the building blocks for life and burn them at the same time. And it's incredibly complicated. And if you see it from that point of view, then you have insights, I would hope, applied insights into what's going wrong with cancer when you realize that there's this this tension between trying to burn and create the same molecules at the same time in the same cycle that goes right back to the origin of life. So I'm going to stop there. Uh, practically all of these experiments weren't done by me. I hardly need to say that, but done by various PhD students and postdocs, and it's great fun. And I'm very proud of them because apart from anything else,
They are as far from applied science or usefulness as they could be, and coming to work with me could finish their careers immediately. <laughs> and they've done it anyway, and that's quite a thing. And I hope that they will actually do something useful one day, but I think they should do it in their own time. Thanks very much. Uh, well, Nick, I must admit, from time to time, I have said of some bits of science, uh, uh, what really is the point of that? <laughs> um, I have to say, uh, I don't care that there was nothing about the application. I thought that was totally fascinating uh, on one of the most fundamental questions that we all have. So, brilliant. Thank you. Um, and I imagine that people want to ask questions. Uh, so, we're going to try <laughs> something, our pursuit of progress is unceasing in CSAR, <laughs> so we're going to try a new approach, um, and I'm going to ask my distinguished colleagues, one of whom's running around the back, not to escape, thank goodness, <laughs> but to get his uh, microphone, oh, sorry. and I'm going to, will you try and catch, broadly speaking, um, Andrew will look after the left-hand side, uh, and Caroline will look after the right-hand side, if you want to speak, it's no good asking me, I don't care anymore. Um, <laughs> But will you please uh, get, catch their eye, and when you've got the microphone, they will let <coughs> me know, and I will let you speak, sir. Yeah, I, that, that was amazing. Um, but where my mind sort of breaks down is trying to think about going back and back and back and back, and then what is the unit of selection when you're getting towards the sort of uh, metabolism chain and the, and the proton gradients, and you, you, you sort of... Going, well, what, what, where is evolution working? Yes. How, how did it get going? What, what is the unit Well, that's another lecture. <laughs> um, I, what I'm aiming to do is to try and get this to the level of complexity where you can introduce information in the way that we understand it, RNA or DNA or something. And, and you know, the problem with making nucleotides, it's a real problem. It, 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 they don't just form spontaneously very easily. So the question is, how can you have a... a, a, a basically a chemical system which is capable of bootstrapping itself up to the level of complexity which can make nucleotides, which can allow information to take over. Once you've got to information, I, I think we're plain sailing, really. Um, but to, to have a system which you've got the membranes, you've got, the, um, you've got a system which is making organics and getting better at making organics. I could have shown a couple of extra slides. Uh, we, we've done some modeling. Um, the modeling makes predictions which we can test, but the, the, the essence of the idea, uh, which is probably daft, but it, it may actually work, is that if you're making some organics badly across this barrier in one way or another, um, the, the kind of ones you're most likely to make, I showed you, are, are fatty acids and amino acids. These are the ones that are the most thermodynamically favored. Um, so forget about nucleotides or more complex informational molecules. What would you expect them to do? Well, the fatty acids will spontaneously form a membrane, a bilayer. It's basically as simple as a soap bubble. That's what they do. So you will get cell-like structures forming uh, at quite low concentrations, even in the oceans. Um, even in alkaline conditions, we've shown this, but I've not talked about it today. Um, the other thing you'd expect to happen is that some amino acids would tend to bind onto the surface of the minerals, and especially looking at the energy-converting hydrogenase and all these iron sulfur <laughs> proteins, you'd expect that cysteine should bind directly onto the surface. And we thought, well, maybe it would hinder the growth of these crystals if it binds onto the surface, stops them becoming a larger crystal, and then you have more smaller crystals, so that's good. And maybe these more smaller crystals would be more likely to associate with the membrane just because they're smaller and they've got a charge or no charge. You can think of it either way around. And if they're in the membrane, well, you've got something which is a bit like the active site of the ECH. You've got an iron sulfur crystal mineral collated by amino acids, the same amino acids that are at the active site, associated with the membrane in a natural proton gradient. That should drive organic synthesis. That should make more amino acids, more fatty acids. The amino acids should bind to these minerals. And you should have several positive feedbacks going on. And you can show computationally that that will drive growth. But it makes, you know, it, ma it makes some mad predictions about under what conditions will it drive growth. And we started testing those to see are these conditions at all reasonable. And the first problem we have is, well, the literature says if you make a fatty acid vesicle, 
and have it at 70 degrees C in strongly alkaline conditions in the presence of calcium and magnesium ions, it will fall to pieces immediately. The actual fatty acids you produce, if you make complex mixtures of them, which is the kind of thing that people have done, uh, they make more robust vesicles that are more likely to hold together under those conditions. And we can find that we can collate iron sulfur minerals in the presence of cysteine, but only at alkaline pH, only at pH 9, when the cysteine loses a proton and then binds strongly onto the, onto the iron. In the, and, and you get iron sulfur clusters forming spontaneously. We're trying to see now if they bind to the membrane in the way that we hope they will. That's a more difficult question to get at. But we've effectively got a, a, you know, a system which this is basically a form of membrane heredity. The, what the cell inherits is a membrane with, with a kind of a, a very simple molecular machine that makes organics in the membrane. Those organics include more membrane plus the, the components of the machine, you might say. So it's, it's, it's never going to evolve great complexity, but it's going to get better at making copies of itself. And then the question is, well, where do these pathways come from? And one thing we've learned over the last few years this was, this was written off by Leslie Orgel um, as if pigs could fly chemistry. The idea that a whole metabolic pathway like the Krebs cycle could spontaneously appear in, in you know, any kind of prebiotic conditions. I have to say, he had a point. Um, but it's been done. So Marcus Ralzer here in Cambridge when he did it um, and, and um, a, a guy called, um, I always forget this guy's name, it's terrible. He's going to come back to me in a moment. Um, anyway, him. <laughs> They've succeeded in showing that under the right conditions, usually in the presence of iron as an electron donor, when an iron is not very believable, but it shows that it can work in, in, in principle. Joseph Moran is the guy's name. Um, will produce all the Krebs cycle intermediates, bar one so far. I don't think anyone's produced oxaloacetate, but all the rest have been formed spontaneously under prebiotic conditions as more or less a complete pathway, which is what you'd have to posit would, must happen if a pathway is going to, you know, if, 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 if the Christian de Duve idea is that selection is going to operate on a natural geochemical pathway, then that pathway has to be there spontaneously, which is hard to believe it would be, but in fact recent work shows that some of them at least are. It's flimsy, I know, but it's all we've got. This side, please. Um, hello. Um, do you think that it's possible that... Um, oxygen-based metabolic systems existed in, uh, in very early cells? And a bit more specifically, um, did, uh, do you think cytochrome oxidase had a role in, in, in those very early cells, if, if that happened? Um, so I've changed my mind somewhat on this since I wrote Oxygen. Um, <laughs> That's the problem with writing books, is it kind of stays there, uh, and uh, I, I now disagree with quite a lot of what I wrote then. <laughs> but <laughs> but I, I don't want to change it, because a lot of people disagree with me now and agreed with me then, so I, <laughs> so I don't really know. Um, I think what I didn't appreciate fully when I was writing Oxygen, this, this beautiful work going back to... Uh, the early 1990s that suggests that cytochrome oxidase arose very early before there was any oxygen in the atmosphere from photosynthesis. It arose before photosynthesis. Um, and, and there are ways to imagine how you would get, have a certain amount of oxygen in the atmosphere from splitting water or from hydrogen peroxide. will produce trace amounts of oxygen, but it's possible to imagine that those could build up in certain environments. For example, ice will tend to concentrate uh, hydrogen peroxide. And... These enzymes are widely conserved and are found. If you try to reconstruct the genome with the last common ancestor of all of life, it has antioxidant enzymes like superoxide dismutase, which would imply that there was some oxygen. But um, the other explanation for why you would see superoxide dismutase there is that it, it arrived by what's called lateral gene transfer. It was picked up from other cells because it was useful. So at the time of the great oxidation event, when oxygen began to build up in the atmosphere, it was very, very useful indeed to have antioxidants and to get them from wherever you could. And so you grab from this random cell over here, you grab that gene for this protein, and, and you now have it. And if you sequence that tree, that happened two billion years ago, it really looks as if it was always there. And, and because all these different branches of the tree of life have the same gene, you would construct them going right back to the beginning, whereas in fact perhaps it was only this branch that then passed it around to everywhere else. It's very, very difficult to show that this happened and that didn't happen. The, if you look at the balance of 
metabolism that you would reconstruct in these cells, they're strictly anaerobic. They don't deal with oxygen at all. They're absolutely stuffed full with iron sulfur clusters. So I think that um, although I argued in oxygen that there would have been some oxygen and that there would have been antioxidant enzymes and possibly cytochrome oxidase very early on, I now don't think that's the case. Um, and I, I think it got there by lateral gene transfer. But maybe I'm just wrong now. <laughs> Do you uh, have any comment about where uh, chirality comes in? So you get D-ribose and L-glutamate and yeah. all the rest. So, um, yes, I would say enzymes. So if people who are not familiar with that, life is chiral, which is to say all amino acids are the right-handed version and all sugars are the left-handed version. But in, in, in nature, without enzymes, you could have both, both hands. Um, and so there's been you know, a long-standing interest in why the right hand of this or the left hand of that. Is there some tendency a bias towards forming this hand in cosmic chemistry or something. And there it often is, but it's a very small bias. But there's another lesser known uh, chirality, which is in membranes, in glycerol phosphate. So glycerol phosphate is the head group that joins the long hydrophobic tails. And it's a, it's a hydrophilic head group. Um, and there's glycerol 1 phosphate or glycerol 3-phosphate, which refers to the position of the phosphate in this 3-carbon molecule. And all bacteria have glycerol 3-phosphate, and all archaea, which is another domain of life that look a lot like bacteria, have glycerol 1-phosphate. And there are almost no known exceptions to that, maybe none. It's a little bit disputed at the moment. But essentially, all this half of life has only the right hand, this half of life has only the left hand. So it's what's being called dual homochirality. Um, and I, I think all that means, what it, what it shines a light on is that it's just the enzymes, that these bacteria use this enzyme that perhaps approached from kind of above down onto the substrate, and this one approached from below and came up to it, and, you know, it's just toss of a coin. There's no chemical difference between these two forms. Chemically, they're exactly the same. So there can't be any selective benefit to having this version over that version. It's really a toss of a coin as to which one you get. But enzymes have to be chiral. If you have an enzyme, it's got a shape. And, you know, it's like a glove. You put your hand in a glove. You can't put your right hand in the left glove. And the same for an enzyme. It's got to take the left-handed or the right-handed version, and it can't do both. So as soon as you have enzymes, there's only a few points in metabolism where you're forcing a pathway to be left-handed or right-handed. And as soon as you've done it to that, everything else has to be left-handed or right-handed. And so I think that it's a storm in a teacup. I think that all this chirality just comes from enzymes. As soon as you have enzymes, you're forced to go one way or the other, and it's as simple as that. The enzymes are already chiral, so... Yes. Pushing I'm pushing it back to... You could push it back to mineral surfaces. You could push it back to amino acids collating minerals, but I would say that it's far more likely to be a product of the information age and natural selection. And as soon as you have an enzyme which catalyzes a key branch point in metabolism where the molecules it's dealing with are chiral, you must enforce chirality at that point. And in future, when you're making the enzyme, you're obliged to use only the right-handed or the left-handed version. So it has to be very early in the information age, but I don't think you have to find a physical mechanism to explain it. Um, so I think you've always been saying that there's an inherent massive uncertainty in sort of life coming to be, but sort of the, the way in which you seem to be looking for a, a, a sort of genesis for life seems to be relying on um, you producing at least sort of the start of life within your lifetime and uh, or within the lifetime of your flow reactor. So do you not think if, if you manage to create a sort of um, prebiotic molecular pathway that that might be a beautiful solution that's probably not true because it's too good compared <laughs> to how, how rare we think the start of life should be? Um, I don't think we have any real idea on how rare the start of life should be uh, or how long it should have taken. 
I mean, Francis Crick partly wrote life itself on the grounds that four billion years surely isn't long enough for something as complex as a bacterial cell. Um, but a lot of things will, you know, membranes will spontaneously form. Um, how, how quickly, do, how long does it take? I don't think we have any idea at all. We're dealing with really an area of science that is in its infancy, which is to say self-organization of, of organics. Um, can a ribosome self-assemble, something as complex as that? It's hard to believe, but we don't really know. And you can take them to pieces, and they will self-assemble back into the larger structure. But that's not starting with the, the amino acids. It's starting with the subunits. I don't think we should necessarily think it's going to take tens of millions or hundreds of millions of years. Uh, De Duve, again, had a nice insight. He said it's all chemistry, and if it's chemistry, it's either going to happen spontaneously or it's not going to happen at all. And if it doesn't happen spontaneously quickly, it's going to have got washed away. Um, and so there's got to be a driving force. I would say they've got, they've got to be focused in the same place at the same time, and you're going to have to have continuous flow. Uh, you know, we don't realize that we have continuous flow <laughs> because we can't see it. But we have a continuous, you know, we're breathing continuously, we're respiring continuously, we have got a continuous flow of electrons in the respiratory chain. Um, and if you don't have that structure and the ability to breathe in and breathe out and so on, you have to have a flow system instead, which is going to do it, do that for you, free of charge. And again, that's going to wash away anything which, so I, my, my feeling is it had to happen quite quickly. Maybe not to the level of complexity of a bacterial cell, but to the level of a complexity of something which is capable of making copies of itself. Maybe we should think in tens or hundreds of years rather than thousands or millions of years. Not because I think that's true, but because you know, we, we've got this idea that it's got to take millions of years because it's so complicated. Maybe we need to change our mindset. And that also is helpful if you're thinking about a lab because then you don't have to think, oh, well, <laughs> what's the point starting? It's going to take millions of years. <laughs> um, you know, you can think, what can we do this week? What can we do, you know, in, in three hours? What happens? Something should happen. Um, and then it becomes much more exciting, which is important as well in research, that you should have a feeling that you may get somewhere soon. Um, the other thing that makes me, you know, Darwin said that once life emerges, it's going to be so much better at hoovering up all the raw materials that nothing else will ever have a chance of getting started. And I think that still stands, um, that as soon as you've got life, it's very unlikely that it's going to start a second time. Um, but we almost do have, I showed that slide with the two separate emergences of the bacteria and the archaea. We know for a fact, really, that they share a common ancestor because they have the same genetic code with all its peculiarities. They have, uh, they're both chemiosmotic, so they have these membranes and proton gradients and so on. They, they share too much to be uh, separate origins. But their membranes are very different, fundamentally different to each other. I already said the left and right hand versions of glycerol phosphate. Their cell walls are different. DNA replication is different. They're, they're really quite fundamentally different. And so that then phrases the question differently. Why would, you have two, why would you have two forms of life which share a common ancestor if one kind of emerged from the vent? You'd expect it to take over the world immediately and the other one will never get out because it's kind of a proto form of life. So why do we have two? Well, I mean, I think you'd have to posit they emerged almost simultaneously. Um, and you can think of reasons why they would emerge almost spontaneously. I, I haven't talked about it, but how did pumping start? If you want to survive on a natural proton gradient in, the, in a hydrothermal vent, you have to have a leaky membrane. Otherwise, you, the protons come in and stay in. If you want them to come in and leave again, you have to have a leaky membrane. If they're coming in and leaving again, well, pumping them out is really not going to help you. So then the question becomes, how, why would pumping start? Uh, and uh, and you, if you think about the divergence of bacteria and archaea in terms of the origin of pumping, then you would get two separate divergences at the same time. It's hard to believe it's not just complete make-believe and just imagination on a computer, but, uh, you know, <laughs> there is a deep divide there. There is a problem, and this is a solution to the problem that may or may not be true, but it, it's, you know, I think a constructive way of wrestling with the question. I think we're going to stop right there. Uh, right. Nick, that was absolutely fascinating. Uh, and what was so elegant was the way you took us right to the edge of what we could almost think we could understand. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, and, then, and then talk about the things that we still don't understand. Uh, um, I, I, for one, and I suspect many here, felt we were right on that edge of discovery with you, which has been 
absolutely fascinating. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much Appreciate indeed. It. Thank you.